Kid is uh, Avisha Patel, and he will tell us about Strange Meta. So please go ahead. I think that you can uh, also see us in the screen. Okay. Great. Yeah, looks good. Oh, all right. So uh, thanks for inviting me. Uh, and I'll be speaking about uh, a body of work which has led to uh, what we would like to consider as a universal theory of strange metal behavior from which arises from spatially random interactions. Um, so this is just a quick recap of uh, strange metals. I, I suppose a lot of people here are already familiar with strange metals, but what what they are is that there are several two-dimensional or uh, or layered materials uh, which in uh, which have strongly correlated electrons, and they have they display in their phase diagrams uh, compressible metallic phases that are unusual and they are unusual in the sense that unlike uh, land of fermi liquids they have a electrical resistivity whose temperature dependence scales linearly with temperature as opposed to uh, opposed to t square uh, and this often occurs near some kind of quantum critical point uh, the exact type of quantum critical point differs between different materials, uh, but there's usually evidence that there is uh, approximate quantum criticality to strange metal behavior. Uh, so in uh, a T linear resistivity in and of itself is not that unusual uh, because it one definitely can find it at, at high temperatures where phonons are activated, so above some Debye or block recognition scales. But what is very interesting about uh, this and these strange metals uh, is that this T linear resistivity extends down to uh, very low temperatures. Uh, so for for example, uh, there's this uh, result on on NDLSCO cuprates where the superconductivity is suppressed by magnetic fields and the T linear resistivity uh, extends down to temperatures below below 10 Kelvin where uh, the phonons are certainly not playing a role. And there's also this very beautiful experiment uh, from last year on magic angle twisted bilayer graphene where again the linear T linear scaling of the temperature dependence of the resistivity it can extend down to temperatures that are like 40 millikelvin uh, where, where there are no phonons. And this, this T linear behavior and the resistivity is often accompanied by other signs of strong interactions like a T log T specific heat, uh, which implies a strong temperature re dependent renormalization of the quasi particle effective mass. Uh, so the, this is uh, this, this low temperature T linear behavior is def uh, definitely a signature of strong interactions. So since this is a strongly interacting metal and uh, not, not a land of Fermi liquid, uh, there, uh, what is usually done when in theories is to consider a Fermi surface coupled to coupled to some bosonic mode that can mediate strong interactions between electrons. So such a bosonic mode is in, inevitably gapless at, at low energies, and there's no screening, and that 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 bosonic mode comes from critical fluctuations of uh, order parameter near a quantum critical point. Uh, so you couple your electrons to that bosonic mode, and there's a very old uh, canonical theory, I think it was first pointed out by Patrick Lee in 1989, uh, that if you just do self-consistent Ashberg equations for uh, the fermion and the boson propagators in two spatial dimensions, one will find uh, that uh, you get a fermion self-energy that's omega to the two-third, uh, which destroys quasi-particle peak in the spectral function. Uh, and 
and you have a, a metal which is you know where without without quasi particles which is a non fermi liquid um but you know when if from the point of telinear resistivity this theory is rather useless because what happens is uh, that it's a translationally invariant clean system and because of that there's a conserved total momentum and you are at a, a finite charge density, so you cannot, there's no way, there's not a compensated metal, you just have one Fermi surface at finite charge density, so you can't excite currents without exciting momentum. And because you can't relax momentum, that means you can't relax currents, and you get, you get an infinite DC conductivity uh, up to, you know, like v clap processes that would occur if you put it on a lattice, which would uh, give a T square resistivity at, at best. So there's there's no way you can uh, you can get uh, T linear resistivity out of this. So in order to to get uh, you know this pretty large T linear resistivity down to very low temperatures, you need to be able to relax momentum. And, uh, and the only reasonable way you can do that is to consider the effects of disorder and impurities uh, in in the in your system uh, and that can cause momentum non-conserving collisions and, and relax momentum. So one can naively uh, try to add disorder to this theory of the non-fermi liquid metal. Uh, the simplest thing to do is just add a random potential term for the fermions. And if you do this, that changes the, the low energy structure of the fermions green function. Uh, and because of that, uh, if you do your Eli Ashberg theory again, you get a different kind of Landau damping for the boson. Uh, you get uh, Z equals two boson uh, with this diffusive propagator instead of Z equals three. Uh, and then you, you get a different kind of fermion self energy in two dimensions, which is not omega to the two third, but it's a less violent. Uh, omega log omega frequency dependence plus of course a, a constant that comes ju just from the random potential itself and this this omega log omega fermion self energy leads to uh, a quasi particle decay rate that's that scales as energy so you uh, in, if you do this calculation finite temperature you find that it scales as temperature and just this this omega log omega self energy also produces this uh, t log t specific heat uh, however from the point of view of transport um, you know what what happens is that your know, fermion boson interactions uh, the fermion scatter of bosons that that are mostly close to zero momentum because the boson propagator is peak q at near q equals zero and those are for momentum conserving forward scattering processes that don't relax any current or momentum uh, and you don't so therefore the, the this fermion boson interaction doesn't give a transport scattering rate that's linear in temperature even though you have a quasi particle decay rate that's linear in temperature uh, so we, we need we need something more than just you know, just this this very naive treatment of disorder in the problem, um, and one way to uh, well, what we figured out is that you know, the having this just potential disorder is not enough, and the, actually, in in your material, whatever disorder is intrinsic to it will also affect. Uh, the interactions between between electrons. So one can uh, there are like uh, STM measurements on on cube rates which show that like the superconducting gap can vary quite dramatically between uh, between different regions in space, and you know that that. That is sort of evidence that the interactions that lead to superconductivity are also varying quite dramatically. So that's the disorder in the interactions. Uh, and one can also 
think of this from a Hubbard type model that you have a T and a U, a hopping and a Hubbard U. And if you have disorder in your hopping, uh, then that that leads to disorder in, in the spin-spin exchange coupling that's derived in second order perturbation theory. So instead of T square over U, now you have T plus delta T square over U, and that leads to delta J. Uh, and delta J is delta T over T. Uh, so one one that that you can have a random exchange interaction that way. And if you decompose that with the Hubbard Stratodovich transformation, you get a random boson mass, but you can also rescale your bosonic fields in a spatially dependent way and transform that random mass disorder in the boson to actually a random a, a disorder, a random coupling between a random Yukawa coupling be, between the, the fermions and the bosons. And this in in this this theory this this leads to considering a, a random g prime shift in in the uniform yukawa coupling uh, so take the same theory as before but now we add this the spatially random yukawa coupling in, in so if we do that uh, we can again do our early ashberg theory and compute compute the fermion self energy in two spatial dimensions and again it's omega log omega but now there are two sources of omega log omega there uh, there's one that comes from the that's the previous one which comes from the g interactions and now there's also the the, the randomness in the g interactions gives another omega log omega term so basically the coefficient of omega log omega is affected by the randomness and in the interactions, uh, and well, the boson is still still got this uh, diffusive form, uh, which is q square plus mod omega. So this this looks very similar to what we just had with only potential disorder, but for transport, this this random interaction, this this randomness in the Yukawa coupling actually makes a huge difference. Uh, so if we, uh, you know, try to compute the conductivity uh, within within uh, perturbation theory, people uh, com it's compute conductivity by uh, resubbing self energy and and vertex corrections to the pro uh, to the current current correlator. Uh, so they're usually just these these four diagrams with the self energy and the the ladder diagram and then these two aslamas or larkin diagrams uh, so what one finds is that uh, you know the the g interaction uh, it continues to just induce forward scattering between fermions and bosons and therefore it it just cancels uh, the most singular contribution just cancels between between the self energy and the simple vertex correction uh, and what, but the G prime interaction is not forward scattering anymore because but it's disordered. So you can actually have large angle and momentum relaxing scattering. Uh, and yeah, so then what happens is that the G prime interaction doesn't cancel between self energy and vertex corrections. And therefore you get a transport scattering rate that that is similar to uh, uh, it just comes from from the self energy contribution and well these aslamas are larkin diagrams in in the limit of large fermi energy uh, they only uh, they almost cancel each other and you know they only produce uh, uh, a scattering rate that's energy square over the fermi energy so that's not not important for for the most singular piece. So now you do now have a, a T linear uh, piece that comes from comes from the G prime interaction and doesn't cancel with vertex corrections in the transport scattering rate. Uh, so one gets a transport scattering rate, which is a residual resistivity, which just is just determined by the potential disorder. It's just a V square. Uh, 
and then we have uh, this this correction uh, which is the, uh, linear in energy so that would be linear in temperature you know in a finite t uh, calculation and that's g prime square times t uh, so yeah at, at low temperatures as as t goes to zero this this g prime square t term is, is smaller smaller than than the residual piece which is like what you uh, you could see in like those twisted bilayer graphene experiments for instance um, and you know one can also compute ac conductivity uh, at finite frequency and then uh, there is this mass renormalization in optical conductivity which has this uh, this log form which is also in uh, and there there is also experimental evidence for this there's a recent paper by antoine george and, and company on on this thing uh, so yeah that uh, that's basically it that Avishka, sorry, there is a question in the chat from Pierce Coleman who is asking if uh, the disorder in G prime is also giving a residual scattering rate. Uh, yeah, not not within not within this no, Eliasberg calculation, uh, and you know this Eliasberg calculation can also be formally justified by a large n SYK type construction, which I haven't invoke just to keep things simple but it's there in the papers but within within the scope of this calculation it doesn't generate a residual piece uh, but if you are not using that that large end construction uh, you, you, it, the, it it will i mean the, there will be higher order diagrams which generate some uh, residual contribution i think so you'll always have some some residual residual resistivity plus a linear T correction. Uh, well, can you hear me? Um, I wondered yeah. if that's a kind of self-serving result though. Uh, is there any way of measuring the G prime disorder? Is there any way that an experimentalist who improves their sample and brings the residual resistivity down to a tiny amount can, can still say that, you know, I mean, it looks to me as if you can always say, well, you've got the most wonderful sample you've ever made with a tiny residual resistivity, but I still declare to you that it's disorder that's driving your resist linear resistivity. How can you test your idea? Uh, yeah, I mean, there are, you know, there, there are different ways of inducing disorder in experimental samples. Uh, I think the, the most common way is irradiation and that that creates a lot of residual resistivity but uh, one would have to uh, let me give you an yeah. example cerium cobalt indium 5 it has yes. a beautiful linear resistivity the linear rise is probably 100 times maybe even 150 times larger than residual resistivity can one then still boldly go and say well i still think you've got disordered coupling to your uh, critical bosons yeah, I would I would think that's the case. I think when these these two can have, um, they're they're not they're not the same thing. They're they're, they're right. Um, so how can I test that hypothesis that it's coming from disordered coupling to uh, critical bosons? I mean, well, one one thing that critical bosons do is well, they can condense that you can have a phase transition. So. Uh, if that you will could... happen even if the, even if they're just, they're they're ordered even if the coupling is ordered. What I would like to know yes. is how, how to quantify the randomness in the boson coupling in an experiment. Yeah, so uh, yeah, I was just going to say that if you know that you had do have the randomness in the coupling, that when you do have a phase transition to the ordering phase, like all all parts of the sample may not order at the same time, so you could have some uh, emulsion of, of ordered phases and, and disordered phases. And if you but, could but just see something you a little like bit that. that. Is the hypothesis falsifiable? Uh, so, sorry, Pierce, to interrupt you, but I mean, from the formula is just showing the residual resistivity is the coupling V and the slope is the randomness in no, the no, coupling. I, uh, 
Thank you, oh. Natasha. I've understood that perfectly. But what I want to know is whether this Are hypothesis is falsifiable by experiment, or whether it's always going to be something that you can claim is the case. I don't have a complete answer to that question. I was uh, maybe if you would use there is absolutely no evidence of any inhomogeneity at all near a phase transition. Uh, like there's, there's, it just look the sample just if you take zoom in with STM or whatever, and the sample looks exactly the same. You have exactly the same uh, phase at all points in the sample, then then there's no like you're not having any kind of variation in in the order parameter close to a phase transition then yeah then maybe uh, then this then this theory doesn't apply uh, but, thank you yeah so maybe we can let just avishkar conclude if you still want to say something otherwise there are other questions here oh uh, no i think that, yeah that, that was that was I'm the last slide too. so okay Okay, okay, thanks very much. So maybe we thank you first. <laughs> Sorry. And uh, let me, the additional question here in the audience, just a second. Yeah, I have a quick technical question. Maybe you can just uh, very quickly answer. Uh, you have two terms, both omega log omega. One you explained uh -huh. come from small momentum scattering. Another you said doesn't involve small momentum scattering. Is due to randomness yes. of the interaction. Uh, yes. How you get omega, how you get omega log omega, which doesn't involve small Q scattering. It's just oh. maybe you can sketch quickly how you got it. Right. So let me just uh, go back to. Right. You have we have this this diagram here. This self energy. Right. So if if it's a G prime term. There's this additional line for disorder averaging uh, that that you have to add. That so what happens is that the momentum being carried by the boson and the internal fermion are, are different now. They're not they're no longer the same because you know it's not uh, you have a small Q boson, but you also have the disorder line and the the change in the fermion momentum is the boson momentum plus the momentum in the disordered line so it can be quite big so it's not small skew small q scattering oh. uh, there are other two questions very quick question please uh, i also want to ask some technical question uh, in the your last uh slide you explain yeah. one over tau transport uh, it consists of two terms one is v square and another is related with g prime yes uh, uh, if you take a look at the contributions at the same slide you look at the e uh, sigma g and sigma g prime you can yeah. see that g and G prime has different dimensionalities. At the same time, in your Lagrangian, you put them side by side. So it is supposed that they have the same dimensionalities. So I want to understand what is the uh, dimensionality of G prime, because uh, it is not just uh, some technical problem. Uh, now it has uh, important consequences in one over tau. Uh, yeah, that, what are that... dimensionalities of G prime? and G, are the same or different? Sorry? No, there. I believe that this is misprint, but then you see that it gives you V square. So if it is proportional to V square, so you will have both terms proportional. So just renormalization. So uh, I want to understand this. Yeah, I think that it, we did uh, uh, yes so, so the question is why if you took the self energy the contribution of, of the boson to the self self energy the times in g and g prime have different dimension one is divided by v square and the other is not so it's just a misprint or there is they are really different dimension no they, they are they are they are different I and mean, this this result yeah. for the self energy yes 
Uh, so the, the square. More details we discuss later. So some of the question was coming from this. Uh, okay. Now, okay, I, I'm sorry I have to, to cut because we're already running out of time. So let's thank again uh, Avishka, all the nice folks, and uh, Andrei. Yeah.